uh, at this point, you know who I am. Uh, you know about the mission that we came on, uh, on board with about a year and a half ago. Uh, so what I'd like to do is talk to you through w patterns that we see in our account base as far as how their data science teams are constructed, how their data science teams share work, how they pull in engineering resources, are they centralized, are they decentralized? And then talk about a new tool that we developed based off an acquisition um, that we think um, has automated away a lot of the very cumbersome things uh, about it, date, sharing data science research across the enterprise. Then we'll actually go in the tool and do some deep fun stuff with deep learning and some other frameworks. So uh, hopefully you guys find this interesting. When I talk to a lot of our customers, and specifically for Cloudera, a lot of our customers exist in this, this uh, uh, G8K, we call it. So the Global 8000 is very large enterprise, usually with you know a, a semi-mature data science practice, um, either uh, a, a nice small group of data scientists or even in some of the larger corporations, pockets of data science that are married to these various lines of business across the organization. But um, when I'm talking to them and I show them this slide, they generally say that they can bucketize their current directives in one or two of these buckets. And it's important to understand what the differences are between these two modes of, of data science practice because they actually come with completely different skills. So I'd say today, I haven't met one of our users that wouldn't, that would say that they're not trying to do some sort of exploratory data science today. Um, and generally, our goal as a, a platform provider is really just to give them as, as much as we can self-service access to that data. We want to point the data scientist at the right data, give them self-service access to it, and allow them to party on the data, which is kind of what we want them to do. So uh, generally in this mode, uh, they are using tools like R and Python, uh, maybe SAS. They're working in a notebook or an IDE environment. Um, so a very, uh, a very com compartmentalized environment versus a distributed system. And generally, the outputs of their exercises are, are static outputs, right? They're a report, they're a dashboard, maybe even they're just a PDF or a PowerPoint, right? Um, and so if we can enable those types of data scientists to get access to data that lives across the organization from financial data to customer data to churn data if we're, if we're a telco company, um, then we can kind of satiate the needs of the uh, exploratory data science mode. Increasingly, though, uh, we see a lot of organizations either today moving towards an operational uh, mode of data science or um, that they have aspirations to do so. And there's a couple key reasons to why um, they have this appetite to do so. Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, when you think about how you quantify uh, data science research, right? Um, it, it's always been kind of a very ambiguous task. So if I was a line of business owner and I came to you and you're the analytics leader, and I said, what is your data science team working on? And I say, oh, they've got some really great stuff. I totally can't show it to you because uh, you won't understand it even if I do show it to you. But let me tell you, they were at 40% last week and they are totally at 55% this week, right? And it's this this big amorphous like thing that no one could judge, right? But when we start moving to an operational mode, we're actually delivering models, we're producing models, we're producing API endpoints or embedded application, that gives us a really nice metric on the back end to say, no, what is your data science doing? And I was like, well, you know, last week we delivered uh, you know, two you know, operational dashboards to the company and some API endpoints for uh, other application developers to consume. And they're like, wow, that's great. That's a nice clean number. Uh, we like nice clean numbers on the, on the backside. You take that to the nth degree, and we have people in the financial services industry that want to start turning their data science team into more of a shared service across their organization. So they no longer want their data science team to be considered a cost center where they're putting money into you know, very uh, highly paid PhD graduates, um, but they're, they're actually um, starting to convince the business to purchase their services across there. And you can think about being an analytics leader and why that's pretty enticing to you because um, you know, that really up-levels the strategic nature of how your data science team uh, operates. And again, the output of uh, these types of exercises, embedded applications, API endpoints, uh, but generally the skill set starts to move more to a distributed systems background, right? So um, expertise around Java and Scala, um, continuous integration, things like uh, integration 
operating with various source control mechanisms. Um, and so this is generally the mode where it requires a good amount of interaction between the data engineer and the data scientist. And whether they sit centrally on the same team or they cross-functionally collaborate across different teams uh, is really just a, a design detail at that point. Uh, but you really can't deliver on the promise of operational analytics, operational data science without you know, some sort of data engineering expertise. So, uh, you know, again, you guys should be intimately familiar with all of this. You know, the, the, the real, you know, modes of a data scientist have a lot of times to do with data preparation, the wrangling of the data, um, any of the data munging that has to happen on the front end. Uh, the obvious modeling, which uh, tends to be the most talked about and the sexiest part about the data science process. And then we might deploy that model, maybe. Uh, depending on how uh, you know efficient our organization is, uh, but we talk to plenty of companies, enterprise companies that struggle for years upon years to deliver a single model to the organization. So it really shouldn't be viewed as a metric of a success. It should be viewed as a metric of how those teams are organized and how efficient you can run as a company. So when I think about this end-to-end -end life cycle of data processing, model development, production, and I think about the Hadoop ecosystem. I generally like to say, if we're thinking about the end-to-end -end life cycle, that Hadoop as a technology is very helpful on the far left-hand side of this diagram. Yes, left. Um, so the ability to ingest and process large amounts of data um, in windows that are significantly uh, quicker than previous technologies is a pretty well-defined canonical Hadoop use case. Uh, you don't have to go far uh, with any Hadoop vendor to understand or, or find a customer use case where we've shortened an ETL window or a data processing window by orders of magnitude. Um, so that's a pretty well flushed out use case. Apache Spark is a very dominant technology there as, uh, as far as our ability to deliver on those promises. I'd also say that Hadoop today is uh, has some competencies on the right-hand side of this diagram. So once a model's developed, the ability to deploy that model with data stores that have low latency and high throughput, there's several actual serving mechanisms inside the Hadoop ecosystem that you can choose from, right? So we've got two of the three areas covered there, which really just leaves us our center section. And this is where um, all of the features are de uh, defined, all of the initial kind of uh, data wrangling happening, the model testing and training happens. And today, our hypothesis is that this work does not actually happen on Hadoop. It's extracted from other systems um, and done on uh, IDE type environments. And while this is the status quo today, we believe that it is unideal for a couple different reasons. The first is that um, in the same way that Excel was dangerous for BI users, in an enterprise we believe that notebooks are, uh, and, and we've heard this from our customers several times, that in some organizations a notebook is a four-letter word. It is a capability to take data out of a governed repository, put it on a laptop, go on the BART train and leave your, your laptop on the BART train. And therefore, you've now exposed your company's data uh, to malicious people um, and any of the IP that you've developed as part of the model building process, right? Um, so there's obviously the secure concern, right? Um, we try to sell this vision of a centralized data platform where everything is tracked. You have full auditing and lineage across the entire platform. And so if we're extracting data out of that platform, it's really a blind spot in our ability to track the full data lineage um, across all of the activities that we're doing whether they're BI related or data science related. Um, so first and foremost, and goal number one, was how do we bring that experience back into the cluster where we have those governed repositories, we, where we have that tracking and auditing, and we can allow the data scientists that direct access to Hadoop data. Um, also, another consideration is that um, when we extract this data, uh, we're obviously dealing with a very small subset of data, right? And so when we're doing our model building, we have to make those kind of generalized assumptions. The second big objective that we had was to improve the experience between these various areas. So once I've ingested and processed all of this data, how do I make it ready to the data scientist and give them self-service access to it? And then once a model's developed in an interactive environment, how do I actually push that model into production distributed systems without a whole bunch of refactoring and re-engineering on the part of other people on my team? And there's some other concerns. Um, and these specifically have to do with the way that systems interconnect with each other. 
so one of the things that we hear pretty often is that generally our data scientists don't have access to the data that lives in Hadoop. Whether it's a security clearance, whether it's the ACLs of the systems that they're using, uh, they don't have proper access to get their hands on Hadoop data, which requires that intermediary step between the data engineer. In addition to that, many popular frameworks and libraries don't read Hadoop native data formats out of the box. So oftentimes there's a, uh, a process to make sure that that data can be utilized in an IDE environment. We already talked a lot about scale, um, again, Small data sets, not big data, not even medium data. And then many of the popular frameworks and libraries that exist in, open data, in the open data science ecosystem don't easily parallelize across the cluster. Hadoop was designed to be mostly a Java-based uh, system. And so when we start putting things like Python or distributed R into production, um, there's a lot of things that don't really work like we would think they would work in a distributed fashion. And there's a lot of underlying mechanisms that are coming up through the ecosystem that are helping that, uh, things like uh, anaconda parcels that give us a base level of Python on each one of our data nodes. It allows us to execute Python code in a way that we can do with distributed systems languages. And then probably the, the biggest pain area was around the developer experience. So. Um, <laughs> One of the qualms that I have personally with a lot of the distributed system technologies out there is that they're often built by distributed systems people and trying to fulfill a need from the Python or R data scientists. And they usually look nothing like an IDE. And they're really just a checkbox item. So if I'm a, an enterprise architect or if I'm an IT buyer and I ask a Hadoop vendor, hey, you know, I've got data scientists that want to uh, write in Python and R, do you have something for them? Well, we have this little open source thing that's not supported at all. Um, so yes, we can, we can kind of check that checkbox. And then once the data scientist actually starts working with it, they say, hey, this looks nothing like my laptop. And one of the hard lessons that we've learned over the years is that the affinity is really in the tool. Um, back six or seven years ago, when we only had a handful of BI partners, um, we would go into an organization and say, hey, you're a Tableau user how do you feel about MicroStrategy? And we would get the middle finger and walked out of the organization. The affinity is always in the tool. You can't rip the tool out of the hands of the practitioner. In the same way, when we had people starting to, to write SQL on Hadoop, uh, we had some very tangential ways to do that. Um, and they were generally uh, rejected by our user base. It wasn't until we uh, developed capabilities like Hue and people could write SQL directly into the Hadoop ecosystem that people said, OK, this is something that I'm, that I'm used to and something I'm familiar with, right? So we've dealt with that a lot. One additional concern, and probably one of the scarier trends that we see in the ecosystem today, is this idea of management of dependencies. So let's say, for example, I have a 15-person data science group. Inside that 15-person data science group, I have five SAS users, I have five Python users, and I have five R users. Inside those five users of each individual technology, there are probably hundreds or hundreds of permutations of that. What version of Python are you using? 2.x, 2.whatever. Um, what types of libraries do you have installed on those? And so for large organizations that want to start creating these small environments for their data scientists to work, they have to create a permutation of each one of those environments to accommodate every single model building activity. And this just tends to proliferate, right? We start to see one, two, three pop up. So that starts to get out of control. Now we have all of these permutations of environments, all with different packages deployed, all with different dependencies baked in, and all for a very specific use. And then when we move on to the next use case, say in an operational throw, all of those remnants are left behind and IT is kind of forced to kind of uh, either deprecate that environment or try to, try to reallocate those resources. So while that is an interim solution, it doesn't really scale to meet the needs of doing all these types of data science. Now that's just in the Python and R ecosystems, all that variation. Now let's throw in things like machine learning and deep learning. And now suddenly we have even more tools that we have to accommodate, none of which the IT organization wants to support in any type of capacity. They may not even be running the OSs that can accommodate these types of tools, right? So this thing starts to proliferate and proliferate and proliferate. And then when we start adding deep learning into the mix, uh, 
it, it, it goes even more from there. In fact, we did a webinar last week where we evaluated uh, Cafe on Spark, TensorFlow, DL4J, Big DL, all of these different permutations, many of them very young, some, some as early as about 11 months old, right? Um, so you can see the bewilderment in a IT org an IT ops uh, eyes when you go to them and you ask them to install an open source project that's only been available for 11 months with no enterprise security. It'll make their head spin around, right? So how do we make it to where, in a perfect world, the data scientist brings their tools to the data, whatever tools they want, whether they like ggplot or matplotlib, whether like any type of visualization software, whether they like Seaborn, how do we make it to where we can deploy purpose-built environments that are intimately synchronized with the Hadoop ecosystem, all of the data stores in Hadoop, all of the access engines like Apache Spark and Impala and otherwise? And how do we make it to where we bring the data scientists directly that data? And for the IT counterpart, how do we allow them to do this on existing infrastructure? They're using Hadoop today to accommodate their analytic database. They've got BI people using the system. They've got DBAs understanding what the query workloads are and transferring stuff off their enterprise data warehouse onto Hadoop. How do we now bring the data scientists into the fold and say, IT, you can give them all of those permutations of environments that they ask for. Um, without interjecting any additional risk to you or, or any operational overhead in managing all of those different environments. So, roughly about one year ago from today, we acquired a small but productive company called Sense. Sense was a software as a service platform where data scientists could collaborate on code and Python and R. They could launch models, they could uh, produce models as API endpoints in very like, like nice siloed ways. Um, but there wasn't, there wasn't anything intimately Hadoop related about the technology. So in the past year, uh, we have re-engineered the data science workbench under this hypothesis that we didn't want to make another notebook, another proprietary way to work with data. We think that data scientists love the, no the notebook experience, but we wanted to solve all of those issues that we talked about around end-to-end -end data science, the management of dependencies, the security when connecting to Kerberized clusters. So in Hadoop today, if we were to chop up the kind of conflated definition of a data scientist today, uh, we really want to accommodate all circles of this Venn diagram, right? So for our domain expertise, we have tons of drag and drop tools that allow you to visually take an algorithm, apply it to a subset of data, do some parameter tuning, um, and get the types of affects that you need. And so for data scientists that are more on the quantitative research side that maybe don't have any coding background, they can work on the Hadoop ecosystem today. Now when we have, uh, and I'll skip to the last one, when we have on the left hand side, we have the people that have that very nice pollination of distributed systems knowledge and statistical programming skills. And for them, our assumption is they're using Hadoop today. They're using things like Apache Spark, they're writing distributed systems language. So the real underserved part of the market that we needed to develop a solution for was this middle section here, right? For the people that want to write in Python or R that don't necessarily want to be distributed systems people. And so for that, we built something called the Data Science Workbench. Data Science Workbench is a secure, self-service environment for code enrichment, for the building of machine learning models directly on Hadoop data. Um, it has some workflow automation, some pipeline building, some stuff like that. Basically, a lot of different mechanisms, and everything that's in there is thought out to ensure that we're giving more self-service access to the data scientist. And it helps in various ways. You can visualize the results. You can have multiple users on the same platform. You can have extensible engines, basically creating those very specific environments for your data scientists. And it incorporates very widely with all the other ecosystem tools out there, whether they're our studio or otherwise. So now we're going to get to our demo. Uh, I thought it'd be fun today for us to plot um, all of the casualties of the Bowling Green Massacre. Um, I think that's it. I think that's the end of the demo. Oh, wait, there's one, uh, Kellyanne Conway's career. Uh, 
Thanks for the talk. Um, so questions uh, about where the kernels actually live. So do they live inside a yarn? Uh, we tried to put Docker containers in yarn before. That didn't work very well. Yep. Or I'm not even sure if it's possible at this point. Uh, so where do they live? Uh, so in this one, uh, and great question, by the way. Um, so Docker on Yarn is still kind of uh, an interesting project for us. A um, couple things there. Uh, Docker requires Red Hat 7.2, I believe. Yeah, 7.2. And not many of the people that run very large scale Hadoop clusters are running Red Hat at all on that cluster, or more specifically, Red Hat version 7.2. So we had two choices when building this product, right? We could utilize something like Docker on Yarn, which would be the ideal use case, because then all of the resources that we need are plentiful and available at any given time. However, the way that we designed it is that there's a series of edge nodes that have Docker and Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the mechanism to deploy the resources to those individual Docker containers. That solves a crucial problem for us. It makes sure that the edge nodes only have to run Red Hat version 7.2, and then anything across the cluster can run CentOS or whatever our heart desires, basically. Um, and over time, we plan to migrate to Docker on Yarn once we feel that OS level requirements generally kind of catch up. Okay, so that would be the, the model for your customers moving forward to, yep. to, to not have two um, different resource negotiators in their T environment. Totally. Uh, funny thing was, Kubernetes actually works really good. It's like specifically for this use case, like we got on there thinking, I was like, well, this is just going to be a hack until we can get Docker on Yarn working. And like realistically, it kind of does everything we need to do today. The, the bummer about it is you kind of have to know how many data scientists and how many workloads you expect in order to size out your edge node configuration to accommodate that. Um, so that's kind of cumbersome. Uh, generally, we've seen those resources to be pretty meager, so it hasn't been a huge deal. But you start to get in like the hundreds of data scientists. Like, Actually, our initial customer for this was the Office of National Statistics in the UK. Um, and they ported 150 Jupyter notebooks into this tool. And so they gave us a real uh, quick uh, burn-in of <laughs> all of these scale capabilities. and it. You know, Kubernetes did a bang-up job. Like, kudos to Kubernetes, yeah.